Well, good morning, everybody. Okay, I had to think for a minute. What is my scripture today? Where do I turn? That's pretty bad. Okay, before we start out, um, Lisa Finley sent me an email last night that she asked me to to read to everybody. She is not here today because she is headed back down to Utah for another um, doctor's appointment. But um, And we love Lisa, right? This is the email. It's long. (laughs) So we're going to pretend like she's right here with us because she is in our hearts. Well, Lisa wrote, she wrote, uh, could you please pass along a great big thank you to the peeps for me? So thank you to the peeps. (laughs) I have received the most beautiful, heartwarming, caring, encouraging, loving cards from some of them, and I know others are praying for me as well. Could you please let them know I feel so blessed, and when talking to others about my cancer slash chemo treatments, I actually tell them how politically incorrect I am, go figure, with all of this, since I have been nothing but blessed throughout this entire ordeal. Never a tear, but always joy. Never fear, but always peace. And the beautiful outpouring messages, whether by phone, card, email, Facebook, stop bys, or whatever, the blessings are truly overflowing. I am amazed and humbled by the responses of my friends and bewildered by the impact, but most of all in awe of God's hand through all of this. I have seen the other side of cancer and chemo with my dad's death and have been touched by other friends who have lost the battle. So I am continually amazed how God is allowing me to see and feel his grace, mercy, love, and strength through all of this. And again, with such absolute joy and protection. I do not know why I'm allowed such beauty in all this. I only know I am held in his hands each and every moment, and in those hands he allows me to feel the blessings of each and every prayer he receives from all of his people. And allowing me to see the power of impact in the smallest and simplest ways, as well as allowing me to rest in his peace while I go through this. His strength, or in his strength, and through all the prayers of my friends and family, known and unknown, I am truly touched and blessed by this journey he has provided. So, thank you all, and I appreciate all of you and your love, kindness, support, and prayers. Lisa. So, continue to keep her in your prayers. She's um, about halfway done with her chemo. Her hair is gone now. So, um, but she's doing well. And she continues to love and praise God, so. People. We're constantly surrounded by people. Um, Yesterday, Jim and I got to go to the Yotes football game. Really enjoyed it. He did, however, and one of the things I really enjoy is the people watching part of it. Jim did tell me, however, that if I'm going to people watch, I really ought to wear dark glasses (laughs) because I think I tend to stare. (laughs) But we are surrounded by people. And often and hopefully usually that is a good thing. We are with people. They give us friendship, support, companionship, family, belonging. Someone to love and someone to be loved by. People to laugh with and cry with and pray for and eat and play and work and sing together to share hopes and dreams and a future. But sometimes people can be frustrating, um, irritating, dare I say even infuriating, (laughs) sometimes a cause of pain or rejection, of ugliness or fear. We want to just run away. Sometimes we want to ra- want run away even when people are good. But sometimes we just want to be alone away from all the people. 
Jim and I are, have been watching, um, I think it's Discovery Channel. It's a show called Yukon Men. Has anybody seen that? All right, Phyllis. We're not the only ones. It's a one of those reality shows about a, a little village, Tanana, Alaska. And it's a very, very isolated village. And most of the 308 people who live there <laughs> wanted to stay that way. The big controversy this season is because the um, Alaskan government is building a road through Tanana, and they are not very happy about it. It's one of the most isolated places that I can imagine a group of people living. And yet, even in their remoteness and even in their isolation, it just fascinates me because they live in community. You know, here's these guys talking about, I don't want anybody being, you know, I want to be out and away and no neighbors. And But yet, they take care of each other. The couple of episodes ago, they're they're running out of food you know it's the it's the end of the winter and and they're running out of food and so a group of about four or five of them went up and were hunting buffalo i think together not for themselves but for the community so even when we seek isolation we crave and need community some people are introverts most of us in here, I think, are. Some of us are extroverts. But we all have this varying need for contact. But God created all of us, every single one of us, for community, for relationship, for love. We need people. We need people now, and we will need people forever. So, we believe. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in God the Holy Spirit. We believe in the authority of Scripture. And today, we're going to talk about what we believe God believes about human beings. And it's such a broad, diverse subject. I mean, it's another one of those we could just spend hours and hours and hours, weeks talking about. But I've chosen three of these beliefs for us to talk about today. They are one, people bear the image of God. Two, people are broken and marred by sin. And three, people have a duty to do good. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So number one, people bear the image of God. We believe in the worth of all humans regardless of gender, race, color, or language, or any other distinctions, and we will respect them as persons made in the image of God. Genesis 1, that scripture that I was trying to remember, very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, starting with verse 26. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. So God created mankind in his own image, male and female together. Do you believe that? Okay. What does it mean? What does it mean that humans are made in the image of God? What do you think? 
special. Okay, good. Different than the animals. Spiritual. It's kind of a tough one, isn't it? It's, I mean, we, we know it, we believe it. What does it mean? Well, you know, I was looking just even to this point in Genesis 1. We see some of the characteristics of God in whose image we are made. Characteristics that he has implanted in us. Creativity. I mean, very first verse, God created, right? Creativity. Goodness. God looked around and saw that it was good because it was made by a good God. Authority. God gave this man and this woman that he made authority over his creation. Life in relationship. Did you notice it says, let us make mankind in our own image and that he made male and female? God is in relationship. He created us from the very beginning to be in relationship. Many, many more things. I want you to think about that this week. What does it mean that you are created in the image of God? Well, God blessed the first humans. And his first command to them, even before don't eat the fruit, was be fruitful. Be fruitful. Fill the earth. Make more people. Lots more people. Fill the earth. And as you do that, rule over all the other living creatures. And he told them, cultivate and utilize the plants. Now this, by the way, and I wish I could go there. I can't. It's another sermon. But this is a call to creation care, not exploitation. Okay. Just because God gave us dominion over the earth doesn't mean we're to exploit it. But we'll go there another day. David, in Psalm 8, wrote, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. In the image of God. But people sinned. And their relationship with God was was distorted. It was different than it had been before. And that's true. But the image of God in people did not end with the fall. Just because sin entered the world, just because we chose to do it things our way instead of God's way, that did not destroy the image of God in human beings. Do you remember the story of Noah? Everybody remember the story of Noah? If you don't, I'd be happy to tell it to you sometime. But the short story of Noah is all humanity, and this was about ten generations after Adam and Eve, according to Genesis uh, 5, I think. All humanity had become corrupt, and so much so that God was so grieved by their wickedness that he covered the earth with a flood. And only Noah and Noah's family, his three sons and their wives, and the animals that were in the ark, they were the only ones that survived the flood. They were in the ark for about a year. And when they were ready to leave the ark, when the water had receded and they were ready to leave the ark, God gave them a whole bunch of instructions And one of the instructions he gave was this, and we find this in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. This is after 
the flood after humanity had become so wicked that God was grieved that he had even made human beings and yet he said in the image of God has God made mankind so as for you be fruitful and increase in number multiply on the earth and increase upon it does that sound familiar isn't that the same thing that he told Adam and Eve you're made in the image of God be fruitful increase multiply fill the earth Noah found favor of the eyes of the Lord, and so he and his family were saved from the flood. And yet he and his sons were far less than perfect. And if you go on reading in Genesis, you will see how imperfect they are, just like the rest of us. God continues to make human beings in his image. It did not end just because we chose to rebel. All people have the image of God implanted in them. Which means that all people are to be respected, to be thought of as valuable, because that is how our God sees everyone. And so to act with contempt toward a person, even a marred, sinful person, is to show contempt toward God. Now, I want you to hear me, okay? That does not mean that we overlook wickedness. That does not mean that we allow wrongdoing to have free reign because evil must be stopped. So if someone does evil things, that that does not mean that we just say, well, God loves you, so I will too, so I'll overlook your sin. No. But neither does it mean that we should permit, much less participate, in disrespect or malice toward any individual or people group. Every single person I lay eyes on is valuable immensely valuable to my heavenly father so I must treat them as such you guys are really quiet good good people bear the image of God People are also broken, marred by sin. Everyone. Just as everyone bears the image of God, everyone is marred by sin. In Romans, Paul wrote that one trespass resulted in the judgment for all people. How many have thought, that's not really fair? Have you ever? Yes. Yes. I see that hand. (laughs) Have you ever thought that? That's not really fair. Why should we all be under condemnation because of one person's sin? Because it didn't just stop with one person, did it? (laughs) Did it? In Isaiah 53, 6, it says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Does anyone have to teach a child to be selfish or disobedient? That's right. Zoe's shaking her head. Nope. (laughs) The two favorite words of the most adorably cute, sweet, precious little child that's about two years old, those two favorite words are Mine and no. (laughs) We did not have to teach them that. All have sinned. No one is righteous. Not even one. Romans 3.23 For 
all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all broken. We're all in need of repair. And not only that, none of us is able to restore this wreckage that we've made by our own strength, by our own works of determination. On my own, I am absolutely and completely without hope. And so are you. But, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is such good news. If you have not yet memorized that verse, it's Romans 5, 8. If you have not yet memorized it, I encourage you, do it. Do it. That verse is such an encouragement to me so often. (laughs) While I was still a sinner. Christ died for me. That's good news, but the best part is this is how God demonstrated his love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are no longer condemned to a lost, broken existence. We believe that people are marred by sin, but we believe that God made it possible for every person to respond to his grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul, who said that one trespass resulted in judgment for all people, said this, and it's Romans 5.18, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people for just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous amen in jesus christ we are new creations we are restored and redeemed and made righteous that is so amazing In Jesus Christ, in God's eyes, we are righteous. We are righteous. We are blessed with new life and new hope. And this is really, really, really good news. It's good news for those who believe. But It's also good news even for those people who don't believe. If, while we were still sinners, God loved us and Christ died for us, what does that mean? What does that mean for people who don't believe? How is that good news for them? If God loves marred, broken people, so must we. While they are still sinners. And, dare I say, even if they never choose restoration, even if they never repent and choose God even as they continue to wallow in their brokenness now again as I said before we don't enable sin loving the person is different than enabling sin it's a a difficult distinction to make sometimes feels like a very gray area, doesn't it? And I don't claim to have all the answers. 
we need God in order to figure out what that looks like for us in each particular situation. But what an amazing truth that as followers of Jesus Christ, because God loves people even while they are in their sin, so much so that he died for them, just as he died for us, we are called as his followers, as his people, to love those people while they are still in their sin. I have a friend. She's become a good friend. She frequently reminds me that she is not Christian. Quite frequently. Almost every time we're together. <laughs> Her ideas about God are enormously different than mine. Sometimes her ideas about God I find rather offensive. But we're still friends, and the conversation still continues. Because, you know, I am not responsible for how she chooses to respond to God but I am responsible to remember that she is immensely valuable to God, and I am to treat her as such. I am responsible to see the same glimpses of the image of God in her that God sees in her. Just yesterday I was talking to her, and she was introducing me to some um, actually some family members of hers and she she introduced me she, she said this is this is Sharon she's my she's my friend and she's my pastor <laughs> and then she looked at me and she said I'm a heathen and I have a pastor isn't that awesome <laughs> It is awesome. It is awesome. God's working on her. I admit, I'm still working on loving broken people. It's not easy. It's not fun. <laughs> it's so easy to see people's offense the ugliness of sin, to be outraged by it, to want to just smack them. <laughs> but when I start to look at people with a critical eye, to think those critical thoughts, I'm practicing this. I'm practicing to use that as a cue to pray, God, you love them. Help me to behave as if I believe that. You notice I didn't even get to the point yet where help me to love them. <laughs> help me to live, to behave as if I believe that you love them. People bear the image of God. People are broken and marred by sin. And people have a duty to do good. Right after God created men and women in his image, and right after he blessed them, the very next thing that he did was he gave them a task, a responsibility. He commanded them to do something and to do it well, not only for their own sakes, because he knew it would be good for them to have this responsibility, this job, not only for their sake, but for the benefit of his good creation. We have a duty to do good, and this is true for everyone, but it's especially true for those of us who are called according to his purpose. Ephesians 2, 
We know verses 8 and 9 very well. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one should boast. But the very next verse, verse 10, goes on to say, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, from God's perspective, to do good is not an option. And although we are to do good to all, God repeatedly gives special instructions about caring for the fatherless and the widow, the poor, the homeless, the foreigner, the outcast. How many people know a child who is fatherless? Raise your hand. Maybe their father hasn't died, but the father is no longer involved in their lives. Raise your hand. How many know a widow? Raise your hand. How many know somebody who's poor? How about someone who's homeless? Someone who's a foreigner? Someone who's an outcast? These are people that we interact with every single day. The fatherless, the widow, the poor, the homeless, the foreigner, the outcast. We will be judged, even as believers, we will be judged according to how we treat them. We have a duty to do good. We are instructed to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. The good news is that it's God's grace that enables us to live that. The love and good deeds I need to do, I need to practice, I need to encourage you to practice as well. But it's God's grace that gives us the ability to do what he has called us to do. I am so thankful for that. And we don't do the good deeds to earn favor of God or of men. We don't do them out of obligation. Well, God loves me, so I best guess I better. We do it with joyful free will. Because this is what we were called to do. This is what we were created to do. Said it right there in Ephesians. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. He knows what he wants you to do. This is what we are called to do. This is who we are becoming, a people who do good. Because all of us right now are becoming who we are going to be for the rest of our lives and forever. So whatever it is you're practicing, that's who you are becoming. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We believe that God creates all human beings in his image, but that, but that that image is distorted in each of us by our own sin. We believe that God's love for every person is so great that he did all that was necessary to restore our connection with him. We believe that our proper response to his grace is to love God, love others, and serve the world, which today we're calling do good. We believe 
that means that we respect the image of God in every person and that we value them as he values them and as he values us. I was listening, set back several times this week, I listened to what has become a favorite song of mine. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us all. Do you believe it? To believe something is to act as if it is so. For God so loved the whole world, we can start with the person that's right in front of us. Amen? Amen. God, thank you for your love. Thank you that you loved us enough to create us to bear your image. Thank you that we are valuable in your eyes. Thank you that it's not just us who are valuable in your eyes, but every single person that we see every single day is someone that you love dearly. So God, for myself and for all of us that are here today, God, I pray that you will help us to act as if we really, truly believe that. And that as we act toward people, the way that reflects the way that you value them, God, that we will learn to love them the way that you do. Thank you that you have a remedy for sin and that all we have to do is turn to you in faith and receive that gift of grace that you have given us. You are so good. We love you, we honor you, we praise you. You are our God.